Hey everyone, it's Omar Pineda here, your go-to realtor for all things Austin real estate. In our last video, we took you behind the scenes of a foundation inspection with a special focus on a home built by David Weekly Homes, put on by Green Scene Home Inspections. Today, we're continuing our exploration of the home construction phase inspection process with a deep dive into the pre-drywall installation inspection. As a real estate professional, I know how important it important it is for buyers to understand the construction process and the role that inspections play in ensuring the safety and longevity of their new homes. During the pre-drywall inspection process, an expert inspector carefully evaluates the electrical, plumbing, and HVAC systems to ensure that they are properly installed before the drywall is put in place. In this video, we'll be shadowing an inspector, shout out to Clayton Bailey, as he performs a pre-drywall installation inspection on a home built by David Weekly Homes. We'll learn about the tools and techniques they use to identify any potential issues and ensure that everything is up to code. So if you're in the market for a new construction home in the Austin area or simply interested in learning more about the inspection process, stay tuned for some valuable information about the pre-drywall installation inspection and why it's so critical for ensuring the safety and quality of your new home. separation and then um, it's, it's cloudy out I can't see which way we're facing but it, let's say that this was west okay which means it's getting all that afternoon sun and then those bricks are going to expand right so just like when when a road buckles because it's too hot outside that's why we want to see expansion joints in the brickwork every 20 feet so that way it doesn't happen but what happens is if the bricks are just here and they didn't put this little corner piece down and they just put it here. I'm just doing this for pretend. Let's sit, because most builders won't take the extra time to do the tuck and the fold. So they got it here, but they don't have anything here. And they, they go ahead and they stack those bricks on top of there. Hot, cold, hot, cold, what happens? Corner pop. That's how it happens, right? Oh, because they didn't have their separation barrier over that. And that, that dries, so this corner is just naturally a weak spot. So this is so the you, black thing that was over all of that in there when we were talking Uh-huh. Okay. So you want to see that divider there. It's also supposed to be the last thing that catches the moisture from getting back up underneath, okay. right? So what is this? HVAC lines. That's your uh, suction line and your high pressure line. So they've got that nice and taped all the way around. I know I've got my main power servicing it, so that's going to be my big 220 power running in there. Today's code says we also have to have a 110 outlet that's by this mechanical equipment. So I know our HVAC equipment is there. Again, I'm kind of doing all this in one pass versus trying to go, we usually make three passes. I'm trying to shorten it so we can go the ring. Um, so we've got this thermal ply. If you feel it, feel how it has kind of a waxy coat or a waxy feeling to it, right? That's your moisture barrier or your vapor barrier, right? So that's the thing that won't let water through the other side because this, this paper is impermeated with wax. A lot of builders just use a thin paper where they can just staple that paper on there. When we're looking for this stuff, we want to make sure that it's overlapped by at least two inches, okay? If it's overlapped by two inches, you don't have to tape it. If you butted it up next to each other, you have to tape the seams right so that you don't get water going into those spots so any penetrations that are coming through the wall any outlet anything that's there we want to make sure that all of that stuff is taped very nicely so what do we think this is going to be that, that would be a defect if they need to take it off at the bottom i haven't been inside yet but i'm going to guess that's that's going to be a vent hood vent yeah for vent hood so let's go back this way something to plug into to run his equipment on when he's oh, okay. servicing the equipment is that a code department thing yeah okay. it is it just changed in the 20 uh 2020 code okay yeah the NEC update what are these two lines going to be drip lines maybe? 
Thank you. Good job. Water heater. So, Rashida, what are these two lines? Water heater. Yes. So, you've got your you've got your pan and you've got your blow off, right? Um, at first, I thought this was blue painter's tape. I was like, no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> Everybody's seen that TikTok? No, 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 no. When they do that, isn't that where they correct the holes? Or just What's that? When they do that, that blue tape? Could yeah, they, they got to cover that, that up so that water doesn't get back yeah. in there. Ultimately, I really would have liked to have seen this corner right here since it is budding up. I would have liked to have seen some tape right here in that corner, right? Again, me being picky. So what's the point of the blue tape? Just randomly in the middle? They may have knocked a hole in it. So that's a good question. If you over uh, staple and your staple stapler is too powerful and you're pushing through the cardboard, well that compromises that vapor barrier. So now you got to go back and put sta or you know tape that spot up or make it stronger because you just made it weak in an area, right? Anybody want to tell me what this is? Pest control. Pest injection fork. Right, so your so your pest control company home team is very good about getting with their builders and say, hey, we'll pre-wire all your houses with this, so that way all we have to do is bring our truck, we plug into this, and we inject chemicals all through the walls. Me personally, I don't like this system. I personally don't like this system because if you've got these little tubes that are now going to supply chemicals through the house. And the finishing nail guy or the drywall guy easily hits one of these lines and then when they go to inject the chemicals all the chemicals just end up in one spot in the house and then you wonder why you've got mold on this one wall or something weird happening on this one wall i personally don't like this i'm just personal preference and i'm and i have a pest control license so i can talk smack. Oh, because everybody remember about eight nine months ago how windows were like really hard to find and windows yes. vinyl windows got really expensive okay so we're really particular about windows because we wanna make sure that they were installed properly. Um, especially in stucco houses, the thing that we find is that the windows leak and then the, the water gets in behind the stucco and then they end up with mold in the house and they, and they don't know why and they don't know what it's coming from or what happened. Nine times out of 10, it was this step right here during the installation where they just didn't get it right, okay? So you, you've got your, your sized windows and they're going to come in and they have what's called fins on the side, right? And so then they're going to set that in there. This blue tape is the weather stripping. Once we go inside, you can get a really good look at this. But this blue tape should go about six inches up the inside of that window sill. Okay, so that way it keeps water. If water does come down in there, it can shed to the outside. Okay, so David Weekly, they do a good job. Generally, every hole that's here, the manufacturer says, hey, I want I want this to be nails. And so they have to hand nail these in. You hear the nail guns going off over there? So the guy that's just trying to go fast, he'll say, bam, 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 bam. And he'll just shoot some nails into it. Well, the manufacturer's instructions say, you cannot use a pneumatic nail gun on these windows because you'll break the fins, okay? If the fins break, you just compromise the window. So, uh, Paul, I'm going to pick on you for a second because we, we did a podcast together and we talked about this. You get a client that calls and says, hey, I've got water coming in. I've got a, I want to make a claim against my house. And you come out there and you say, well, you've got a big old gap around your window. You didn't caulk it. Sorry, that's on you, right? So if, you ha if the windows were not installed correctly from the get-go, it voids the manufacturer's warranty. Okay, I've got one of my inspectors here in Austin. He's kind of like a window. He just he gets after the window guys because they break these. So he'll take pictures, go to our homeowner and say, hey, did you know that they broke these? And I'm showing this to the builder. The builder's like, oh, yeah, we'll fix it. He's like, they have no intention of fixing that. So he'll go to the manufacturer and say, I just want you to send my buyers of this letter from you as the window manufacturer saying that these windows are broken and we have voided your warranty. Once we send that letter to them, to the builder, the, the, then the builder has to replace all the windows. We don't like doing this, but if you would install it the right way, the weekly way to begin with, you wouldn't have this problem. So stop using the pneumatic nail gun to save time because it ends up biting you in the butt in the end, okay? So when they tape these windows, there's a certain process that it has to be taped. So they do the, the inside first, they're gonna set the window, they're gonna do the sides, and then they're gonna do the top. 
So that way water will always shed to the outside. Make sense? So again, they've done an excellent job here. I don't have any issues with this. All manufacturers. Yeah. So uh, just a little bit, right? They got a little bit lazy here because they didn't use the holes that were already there. They just went ahead and put in the nails where they wanted now, to. Now, when they do this, isn't that what causes the cracking in the last The thing that causes the cracking is if they use like their guns, those real powerful, like, bam, and it hits it, it's just gonna crack that plastic. Yeah, good But question. no, I'm talking about with the window. After, if it's not, <laughs> if, they don't, if it's not installed right, if they don't put it in the holes, is that what causes the window to crack after itself? Uh, no, it's more so the pneumatic gun that's going to make okay, it crack. Yeah, okay. yeah. But let's just say worst case scenario, okay? Let's say that this was stucco, that there was like a, a roof valley that was draining to this window and that water was coming down because they didn't put in the right flashing. I'm trying to paint the worst <laughs> possible situation that could happen. So water is going to come down. It goes inside. There's black mold that shows up kid that moves into the house is highly allergic to black mold, has asphyxiation, has breathing issues, and dies. Again, I'm painting the worst That's possible dramatic. picture here. Very dramatic. So what I'm trying to say is when there's a death or something goes wrong, they're going to sue everybody. So then they're going to go in and deconstruct this wall, and what are they going to discover? The window was not installed properly. Who does that go back onto? The builder. If there's a death lawsuit or there's something really bad that happens, they're going to keep peeling that onion. It's, it's, you're going to cry. You're going to get tears. But they're going to find out what was the culprit of this problem, right? So that's where you, you want to do that. I don't normally talk that crazy with people, by the way. So we're inspectors and we try not to scare people. But I'm trying to get you to realize the severity of, like, these things happen. For every rule that's out there, there's a body. And that's why we enforce these rules. So we're not just trying to be the alarmist inspector. Like something bad happens, that's why we have to have this rule change, right? So taping around the door, uh, just being nitpicky, I would have loved it if this would have been on top, right? And I know there's a porch here, so there's an overhang, so it's not that big of a deal. But it goes the sides and then the top. They added one over there. Well, they did it right up there. Yeah. Every now and then they get it right, you know. <laughs> Every now and then they get it right. Again, I like, on their way to lunch. It's like, okay. I would like to see uh, tape here in the corner of that seam right there. I like to see tape right here as well. Uh, they did these right. They missed the holes here, but they got them right here. What's up with that? So, so that, just that one guy, he was just, he didn't have the same mindset as this guy. Because you can tell two different guys installed that. You guys see that? Yeah. This guy was talking on the phone. He was calling on the phone, yeah. So, another thing. He was running out. Typically, we like to see there's a, a protective uh, plastic over this glass from the, the window manufacturer. And we really like it when it's there because when they go to put in these bricks and they're slopping that mortar around everywhere, if the mortar gets on the glass and dries, it ain't coming off. So they're, they left this glazing, which is the glass, unprotected. So that means the brick mason guys have to be extra careful around these windows because if any mortar gets on there, they better wash it off quickly because it'll stick to the glass. So it's a, another one of those little nitpicky things. We have tornadoes, right? So if there is a major weather event and you have a tornado, you want to make sure all four corners have to have this weather strap. And this weather strap goes all the way into the concrete. So those guys that where we just came from, it's usually the last thing they're going to do is they're going to put these straps into the concrete and then they're gonna bend them back, and then when they go to frame it, they're gonna put them back up. Every hole has to have a nail, right? Um, my neighborhood got hit by an F5 in 2015, and to drive the neighborhood to see, like you can see the perfect four house, five house width of that tornado, where those are gone. But the ones next to them, the four or five houses on either side, some of them were down and some of them were up, and, and the weather strapping, you could tell which ones were weather strapped and, and which ones weren't. Because the ones that weren't, they just blew off their foundation. So when I teach home inspectors in Houston, Houston has a whole nother set of rules because they got hurricanes. So not just the tornadoes coming in from this way, hitting the house from this side, because when the hurricane comes in from this side, the wind hits it from that way. But as it passes, then the wind hits it from the other side. So they get hit by both sides. So they have to have serious, serious weather strapping down in Galveston and Houston. 
So that's why Trek has the rules that you guys can't sell outside your knowledge base. That's one of your rules. Because if you don't know this stuff and you're, and you're trying to help out your family member that's in Houston or Galveston or Corpus because they want to buy a home, you know, a vacation home there, and then you don't know what you're doing and you put them in a situation and something bad happens, it's going to come back on you. So just make sure that you kind of know the area, know the weather and weather events. That kind of thing. One thing what is about this right that, here? you guys, is that most national builders, they build to region kind of, but not specific to locality. <laughs> Right? So if I'm dealing with a large builder that may be coming and doing a lot of work in Denver, and they're putting the same process in place in Texas, it's not going to cover it. The other thing we see on inspections at this stage where it, it's called out on a report is often we're leaving these open so that they can be seen. Um, and then we get dinged on the inspection that maybe we don't have our lap over or something of that nature. And that's okay because we're going to put it there and we're okay with that. The reality is that those need to stay open so that the inspectors can see them. This is your hose bib, right? How many of you suffered losses during Snowmageddon? <laughs> <laughs> the insurance guy's like, come on, dude, stop. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens, though, is the uh, frost bib, the new kind of hose bibs are frost-free protection. So it's supposed to be protected all the way inside this wall. So during Snowmageddon, you have, you know, your bricks that are there. If this is not, that pipe is not insulated and the builder skipped that step and it was just copper pipe coming out, boom, there's your break. There's your water leak right here. Now you got to call these guys to take the bricks out, put the bricks back. And these guys are like unicorns. They're like hard. You're, you're lucky to see brick masons today because you usually don't find them. They're just, they kind of appear and disappear into the night. <laughs> They're hard to find. Really good about snow getting in. Kyle told me about that where you have your usual soffit board, the little perforated holes that are underneath. And then when the wind hits the wall, it goes up the soffit, and then that's what pushes the heat out of the attic. I'll get to you in just a second. I'm not making any. So that's what pushes the heat out. If you have your cornice vents here, then what happens is I can put a whole lot more insulation in the attic without having to worry about the wind blowing that insulation back. So, and I'm just catching the air that's up here on the roof versus the air that's underneath the roof. Question. I wanted to ask, why is it that the brick looks like it's separated from the wall over here? Great question. I saw a YouTube video one time where this agent thought they were an inspector and got all fired up and had their cousin come out, who was this person, and the, and the guys just sounded like an idiot. I'm like, oh, bless your heart. Stop. Just stop. Stop. So how many of you think the brick is what holds the structure of the house? You used to, yeah. right? In Texas, it's just a veneer. It's a wrap around the outside. Wow. It does keep the house from um, raking, shifting a little bit, but it has no structural. So what was your name? Huh. What yeah. was your name? Justin. Justin. Sorry. Justin asked, why is there that gap there, right? So for the same reason, if we have uh, what Larry said was ice damming, or if we get water back behind that wall, so my water protection is here, right? So let's say water gets here, and then it comes down, right? It has to go out. How does it get out? Weep holes. Weep holes. So those guys, every 33 inches, they're putting in weep holes. So you're gonna see them above windows and doors. But there is supposed to be at least one inch separation between that. As we, And I don't want you to mess up their bricks because they're wet, but if you lean back there, you can see the brick ties. So the brick ties you have to have on the first floor and that keeps, uh, that's, you know, bolted to or uh, hammered to your framing, bent over, and that's what's keeping those bricks tied to the structure, right? I did one the other day where I looked back here and I saw it at this point, all the brick ties were just folded back and they were just laying the bricks. It's like, well, why did you even put them in if yeah. you're not gonna use them? Like completely ridiculous. So gotta have those brick ties, but only on the first uh, floor. Depending on where we are, each municipality is a little bit different on the codes that they enforce. So some cities are still in a 2015 IRC, some some are in a 2009, some are, you know, they're still, they just haven't, the city regulatory hasn't brought it up to today's exact code, where we have to talk about today's exact code. Does anybody know what supersedes building code? I like it, it got quiet as a church <laughs> message in here. Everybody's like, what? There's the most <laughs> County, whatever the most strenuous code is. Manufacturers instructions. The manufacturer's huh. instructions are right here. This is how this has to be applied. This is how this has to be installed, okay? That's the manufacturer's instructions. That supersedes building code. 
if you broke what the manufacturer wanted their product to be used as, they're not going to warranty it, right? So how? That's why we have to be knowledge about all the building products and building code. So we've got. To, sometimes you'll get into that argument. Well, that's not code. Well, manufacturer says it has to be installed that way to keep it safe. Okay. Let's go on the inside. What am I looking like? Your time. Sort of how the lower plate looks a little green. Okay. So they've used a treated wood or a sprayed wood. Typically, there's going to be a sticker that says this has been treated with boring. Okay. So that way, when the city inspector comes through that lower bottom plate has been treated for subterranean termites. They have to have this notice or the government, this is a, this is a federal regulation, will not, they won't grant the city state access to have an, an address. So you can't get a certificate of occupancy unless you can prove that you've pre-treated the house first, okay? So stepping over here, you see all the wood that's in this corner. Yeah. yeah. Love that. They did a big old stud pack that's right here. Not me, the wood. <laughs> <laughs> so they've got a lot of extra wood there. That's going to strengthen it up. And then you've got your half inch lag bolts in the corners. Again, weather strapping it. It's going to be there in that spot. These are jack studs. And then you've got your header. Has anybody ever had on a home inspection report where the outside brick above the garage door had a step crack above the brick? Has anybody ever had that happen? So there's a big steel lintel that typically goes in um, up here, right? If they, and this one's not in yet, but if there's supposed to be holes in that 90 degree iron that goes straight across, right? So there'll be big bolts where they're supposed to bolt to this header, okay? Well, if they just throw that lintel up there and they don't mechanically attach it to that header and then you put bricks on it, it's going to bow, okay? has nothing to do with structural movement. It's not a foundation movement, but a, a rookie inspector will say, oh, you need an engineer, you got foundation movement. No, they just forgot to mechanically attach that. So then they'd have to either come from the inside and drill through and hit it, or they got to remove the bricks in a couple spots, drill through and mechanically attach it to that upper uh, header, right? The other thing that we like to see, and they've already covered it up on this one, you can see it on the other side, is that you see your strap that's there. So I want to make sure and verify that I've got my header strapped. So this one is a little bit exposed here, right? And then every hole has a nail. So they did a good job of putting all that together. Um, see, here's your like termiticide little chemical injection port system that's there. I'm looking for these anchor bolts to make sure they're, you know, every four feet you've got anchor bolts. Uh, what is this line here? Remember we started here on the IAC. Good job. You get a cook. <laughs> so this line's going to go up and it's going to go to the HVA system, C system that's up in the attic. What is this thing? Strike plate. It's a strike plate. If you've ever been in your house, you've tried to put a nail or screw it, it just won't go through. There's a reason. <laughs> There's something on the other side of that. So if you didn't put this there and you're putting your drywall up and your AC system was charged with Freon fully or Puron, right, it leaks everywhere. So this is the point that we're looking for strike plates. If your electrical is within one inch of the surface, you gotta have a strike plate over this wood right here. So that way when you're hanging drywall, you don't hit this and arc that out. Make sense? What's gonna be right here in this area? Water heater. Water heater. I love all of you for not saying hot water heater. There's no such thing as a hot water heater. It's a water heater. <laughs> Looks like we've got something else going Plumbing on here too. Plumbing for like a water, 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 softener. water softener. softener. So, um, and then you've got your pan and your drain. So I already know that, you know, the code says that the garage height has to be 18 inches. The water heater has to be 18 inches from the floor, unless it's a VFR rated. So if it's a VFR rated, so it's uh, the fumes, it's okay. You can put that kind on the floor. Does that have, does this, I'm sorry, little leg right here have anything to do with that? Like why do they make this a little bit higher in the garage right. than that? So one of the codes that says you have to protect the water heater from vehicular damage. So they're gonna put in that little curve, okay. right? Some builders want to see like a metal pole. I was gonna say something about my wife and driving, but <laughs> leave it alone. <laughs> they want to see the metal pole there, but they want to make sure that, because if you run into that, 
that it's gonna be, you know, a bad thing. I had a guy, I always tell my clients, like, if you have any problems once you move in, like, call me. And this guy uh, had moved to town. He was with uh, one of the tech companies. He was, he was Chinese and he didn't speak very good English. Brand new house. Calls me out of the blue and says, hey, I, I need help. I, I had an accident. I, I drove through my garage wall. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And he's like, I know it's about to rain and I need some help. And, and I was like, okay, well, where are you? He's like, I'm still in the car. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, get the car out of the garage. Let's, let's go ahead and back it out. But he literally froze and didn't know what to do <laughs> because he thought that if he pulled his car out that the whole thing was going to come tumbling down. I was like, no, 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 you're, you're okay. Back out. I said, I'll send my contractor over oh there and we can, God. you know, plywood, plywood it up and do it. But, you know, vehicular damage, if you've got something that's gas and flammable, you, you want to protect that. Right. Let's go there at the other house. I didn't get to point this out, but uh, I didn't get to see the plans. But if there is a kitchen island and they're pouring the slab, I want to make sure that they have that orange or that uh, blue conduit that's going down through the foundation. Because how else are you going to get electrical over to your island? Mm. <laughs> it's just one of those things that we want to confirm that while we're there to make sure that you're going to get electricity over to it. Right. So the weird thing um, with islands, right, there's no vent stack. Right, so they're, they're usually we want to see something that goes up and over so that way you are an air admittance valve that is something that's in there. So I've got um, electricity, dishwasher, disposal. Uh, I've got some outlets on the ends. Um, 2020 code NEC code says we have to have uh, outlets on the island for every nine square feet that the island is big, right? Coming in here to kitchen, so. Orange wire represents what? Fire the, the orange. So the, the conduit does, but the orange Romex represents a 220 wire. So that's a dryer or an oven, right? Where the yellow is an outlet and no, David Weekly did it right. So white wires would be lights. That's a 15 amp circuit. So that's between a 15 to 20 and a 30 amp circuit is the size of that wire. So notice we have our strike plate here protecting our plumbing pipe, right? What are all these little pieces of wood? Why is it in here and not anywhere else? Cabinets. So yeah, you gotta have something to mount the cabinets too. You can't just mount cabinets to drywall, they'll fall off. <laughs> so not a good moment. So I've got electricity. Here's our vent hood going out. So wherever we saw that other vent, that may have been a dryer vent that was going out to the side. So I've got my refrigerator um, here. So there's my connection for it. Uh, and then I've got an awesome pantry. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah, that pantry needs an extra step. If anybody Ooh. wants to really fill this home, this is the model home. Oh, nice. Right. So if you go down, when you have a chance to come back, go see the model home. See Stephanie and Taylor. They're great. It has this pantry. It's incredible. That's a big pantry. Yeah. And this home with the pantry and the three-car garage is actually available. This one's for sale still. So. Cool. So I've got another orange wire, and that means... Oven, right? So I kind of know this is where my oven's gonna be. I've got another drain over here. This is refrigerator. That's a gas connection over there for the gas cooktop. I got that wrong. So refrigerator is gonna be over here. So, uh, what are they gonna have a gas cooktop or a gas dryer? Shut off. So there's a gas cooktop coming in, and that's gonna be our shut off in the bottom. Okay, so you're gonna have a cooktop over here, and oven over here. Yes. Okay. So we're going to build. Cool. Those. So the oven, microwave, cooktop there on both sides. Yeah, and then it should have. Doesn't look like we put in the UCLs. Cool. So this thing going out, and then um, if you guys will make your way over here, so the windows that I was talking about, see the wrap, how it goes six inches up the inside? A lot of builders won't go that extra mile to go up on the inside. They just, they put it here and stop. Well, if water gets in, I want to protect it as it goes up. On your windows for energy code compliance, so how many of you have sold that 80s or 90s house where we talk about the blown window seals and you see all that like haziness in between the panes of glass. It's real common in the 80s and 90s. Well, now if you look at windows, they're kind of mapped. So you got Southern and Northern. So the first dual pane windows that came out were for Northern climates. In other words, it's more cold outside. They're trying to keep it warm inside. Well, in Texas, it's hot out and we want to keep it cold inside. So it's kind of the opposite. So you have your solar heat gain and your U factor. Um, that's kind of like the R factor for insulation. And so all your uh, energy codes change, and that's why they have to leave these stickers on here so that the city guy or whoever inspector comes through is gonna verify that this meets today's current compliance. 
So when the uh, EPA changes their standards, that's why you're gonna see windows go on sale at Lowe's Home Depot because they're no longer compliant windows and the average homeowner, they can pick them up and put them in because they can sell them to them for no big deal. But new construction, you can't do it. So that's why every now and then you'll see windows go on sale, believe it or not. It's because the EPA has changed their standard for what that solar heat gain or what that compliance is. Um, so if a person is doing a remodel on their home and they're buying those windows, do they still have to meet like limiting permits and codes that they can still put in? It depends on where you're at. It depends on, because some, if you're adding square footage, they may make you because then you're adding, they want to see everything that's in that new square footage to be new. But if it's existing and you're not adding square footage, probably not. Okay. Yeah, good question. Two, we like we like to see without the insulation in. So that's one of the questions when our buyer calls. It's like, where are they at in the process? We want to do pre-drywall, but we also want to be able to see electrical wires running through. We want to make sure that it's wired correctly. It's done because if the insulation's there, I can't really see it as well. I'm still going to inspect it. And I'm still going to look at it, but I can't really see what's going on. So I can see that they got a little shallow right here because I see the strike plates. If I pull this back, you see the electrical there. And it goes here, but here they got it a little bit deeper. So they didn't have to have strike plates on this side, they decided they had to have it there. So making sure that's going all the way around. Question? Um, on your trimmer studs, your jack studs. So I know the weekly way, um, I would probably prefer to see another stick of lumber here. Um, weekly during the lumber shortage, they did advanced framing where they were saying, okay, well, we're only gonna frame the two by six from this side, because typically you would have another two by six out on this outside. So they said, well, to save lumber, we want to do it this other way, well, then we're not using as much wood. And I agree, it's a way to save lumber. But anytime you have your, you've got your top plate in um, Houston, Galveston, those areas, they wanna see those weather straps where it's, where it's going in from that top side. And then here's your load bearing LVL beam. Okay, I've got about five minutes left, so I'm gonna go kind of quickly through this. So your hangers that are here, this is a big load bearing beam for the whole house. So that's how you're able to have these open concepts. Anytime there's a break in the beam or where two beams meet each other, you've gotta have a lot of wood supporting under that. So when we go back to, if you follow that beam all the way over, do you see that stud pack that's right behind her? So that you got to have that many width, like however the width is here, you got to have that same width to carry the load all the way down to the slab. Okay, so this is kind of we get into a little bit of engineering, it gets a little bit advanced just talking about it. Um, but you got to make sure your straps, your hanger joist hangers, all have the nails in the right position. Um, I just did a 4,000 square foot house yesterday, pure and beam. They added on to this gorgeous bathroom sunk in shower and they had joist hangers really long ones and they all had one nail on each side and he couldn't figure out why the shower pan tiles were all cracking out mm -hmm. huge problem right here <laughs> like they didn't go back and support under that right and so the builder just was trying to go fast and do the deal um again i'm trying to move quickly so looking at your ductwork, we're trying to see especially if it's a two-story and there was another story and the ducts going through sort of your uh ceiling joists you want to make sure that it's not kinked or bent. Another thing that we like to see is that those vents are actually covered with plastic. So that way, when they're doing drywall, cutting drywall and making a bunch of dust and that kind of fun stuff, it doesn't get into the ductwork. And then I'm going to step here really fast and then we can go to our next plate. So here's our gorgeous shower. 